Roberta, it's so nice to meet you. I'm so happy to be able to speak with you. And uh, right now you are in Copenhagen, is that right? Yes, actually I'm now one hour away from Copenhagen in Stones at the coast of Denmark, visiting a friend here. Um, he's a musician too, and he built up a very nice project. It's called uh, Scandinavian Cello School. So I drove here today just Fan to see him. And Fantastic. Yeah. What's the weather like over there right now in New England? It's a very brisk and delightful minus five Celsius. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how cold it is here, but the day has been insane wind and very, but very much sun actually. So it's, it's a mixture of everything. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, you know, coming on the violent podcast to speak with me. And, uh, before the interview, you, you asked like how I came across you as a violinist. And for those of you who don't know Roberta Verna, Roberta is the recently appointed concert master of the Copenhagen Phil. And I came across her video on YouTube and it was her concert master audition, which I highly recommend. Actually, as a matter of fact, I'll leave a link in the podcast show notes so that way people can see how amazing a violinist Roberta is. But I want to I want to dive into how uh, you got this position. You know, what was the process of you getting it and what was the audition process like for you? So actually, how I came across the audition was through this friend I'm visiting today. Oh. Uh, he randomly told me, look, there's a position free. Uh, he knows the musical world here in Denmark. And I had my life before that in Germany all the time. And I've never thought of coming to Denmark anytime. Um, <clears throat> and then I just said, okay, why not? And then they, they post, post the date for sending video applications. And this video that you saw on YouTube was actually the pre-selection video that I was just afraid to um how to say i didn't put it on my private youtube just to be sure that they can see it and then i never took it out it was just like public for everyone now and yeah so i left it and then later uh they invited me for a live audition which had in total i think five uh, four rounds uh first round um behind a curtain as always uh with classical like mozart concerto and two how to say audition uh, parts for orchestral excerpts and then second round was without a curtain and third round with orchestra and then we had to play um, solely with orchestra accompaniment and then lead one rehearsal of 20 minutes without a conductor um, and then the the end round like fifth round in total was uh, interview with the orchestra members which was really nice that's a very interesting audition process. I didn't realize that part of the audition for you was to lead a, a rehearsal without a conductor. What was that like? It was very interesting for me because I, 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 yeah, I never worked with professional musicians being so young and then sitting in the front and just trying to tell everyone what I would like to work on. And also, yeah, it was very special, but it felt really, really good. I mean, for, for me also to see how the colleagues react, how, we could work together uh, what's the style of how do we play um yeah and also for them to see what my musical intention might be later on well there's no doubt that there is a a certain maturity to your playing and it, i you know just based on just watching you play and just speaking to you right now i can tell that you know the copenhagen phil is super lucky to have you you know you seem like a really really amazing person to you know be around just like i, I feel like that's also part of the concert master job we, i've spoken to concert masters on the violin podcast you know david kim especially who i know uh, from the philadelphia orchestra and you know there's there's um it's not just about being an excellent player in an orchestra there's mm -hmm. so much more that goes into that have you had any like outside engagements outside of the rehearsal outside of the performances that you have to engage like with the public or do some outreach as your position um well apart from of course all the time you have to be in contact with the management and just be open to new ideas but um i have of course friends coming to concerts and giving me review and feedback which is always nice but i'm quite new to the world here so i don't know so many people yet i but, find that to be also uh, very I'm, yeah i also find it to be very intimidating when your closest friends come to see you perform you know <laughs> i <laughs> yeah. much for and I, I don't know about you but maybe for me as well i'll speak for myself but it's it's always very intimidating when your mentors come to watch you play because you are yeah. because you're just you're playing you're trying to do your best but they know every single thing about you 
<laughs> and I find, right. to, I, I find that to be the most intimidating thing for me. Uh, um, I know you're still new to the position, but what are some, you know, some season highlights that you can share with your audience? Like what were some of the concerts that you performed and uh, some of the mo most memorable concerts uh, so far? Um, if I think back, there has been a lot actually in the last months. Once was um, Brock, Bruckner, Bruckner 7 with a, a conductor called Gietschold with his uh, surname. Um, and he, he will also come back next season or this season. I'm very much looking forward to that. Or also St uh, John Storgard came and we played Schumann Symphony. It was really nice, those two. Uh, moments I remember. Um, also, Christoph Eschenbach came to play with us, which was a great honor. Um, and if I may say it already, I think it's official now. He's coming as a guest conductor for the next season um, to be with the orchestra. I think that's a great achievement for us as well. Um, yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> so a lot, lots to look forward to in in Copenhagen. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I do want to dive in to. Mozart, because as of this recording, today is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's birthday. And I heard so. Yeah. Today, today is the 27th of January. Um, obviously, this episode will be released a lot later. But um, do you do you happen to like Mozart's music? I know that you performed Mozart's five, I believe, for your audition tape. Um, yeah. What, what, what is your relationship to those concertos? And if you can speak on that, that would be great. Well, good question, because I. Huh. I didn't think of that. I, I would say my, my favorite composers at the moment is like Beethoven, but of course we have to play Mozart all the time, but I think he's a genius in, in how he writes and what he writes. And it's just so simple, but also so hard to play. And you have to be as, how do you say, as concrete with the, the things he writes, but also not forget your own intention at the same time. Um, but. Yeah, I, I, I really love Mozart. I remember when I was younger, I, he was my my absolute favorite composer. Obviously, you speak to Beethoven. Actually, I believe I saw um, a really funny Instagram reel where you're, you and your brother, <laughs> uh, <laughs> your, your brother was trying to dictate how you're supposed to play Beethoven or just like messing with yeah. you. Um, is your brother yeah. a musician also? Yeah, he's a, he's a cello player. Yeah. Ah, I see. Okay, so the troublemakers. Yeah. <laughs> cellos are right. all, all my cello <laughs> friends are troublemakers like in the good way i love them to 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 death yeah. <laughs> but um uh, how, how old your brother and do you do you play with your brother often like do you collaborate with him at all he's 20 now and we play a lot together actually of course there's not so much repertoire for violin and cello but we try to find new stuff and just it's amazing to play with my brother because i don't even have to look at him he just knows how I breathe, how I would phrase a, a line, a melody or whatever. It's just without words and it's great work. And I wish, yeah, I wish to do that in the future as well, like on a more professional level and maybe more regular than now because he lives in Germany and I'm in Copenhagen. So at the moment we don't play that much together, but I hope we will in the future. How about chamber music? Was there, was there a moment where you played a lot of chamber music? Not so much. I mean, obviously there's a, uh like Beethoven triple concerto but that's with piano violin cello there's a Brahms double concerto um yeah. I think there's a Kadai violin violin cello duo yeah um yeah have is there like a memorable piece that you have played with your brother like any of the chamber music pieces or um like one time where you collaborate and it was like wow this was really cool I remember well I love chamber music first of all and I I actually happened to start um, thinking or considering to be a violinist after my first ever chamber music project when I was 15 years old, um, because it blew my mind how, how amazing it was to make music. And I realized that back then. Um, and with my brother, I think one of the nicest experiences was uh, a Rensky trio with piano. And mm. a good friend of us played the piano and it's just so beautiful music. And of course, uh, I also played a double concerto by Brahms with my brother and with orchestra it was great uh also very nice just to yeah to be on stage just, i mean it's still being soloist but also playing chamber music at the same time it's, it's very nice so it sounds like to me that there was this very healthy rivalry between you and yeah. your and your and your brother how uh, i was hoping that you can speak 
a little bit about your your upbringing with the violin. How did you get started, and what? And obviously, you just said that the fifth, you know, fifteen years old, that was like the pinnacle moment where you wanted to be a, a musician as a as a professional yeah. musician. But um, I was hoping that you can speak to our audience about what was your your introduction to the instrument. Um, if I think back, I think my parents, because I, I'm coming from a musician family, and both my parents are percussionists, classical percussionists, and they went on tour when they were younger, when it was, uh, I think I was around five years old, to um, Korea, and they brought back home a little violin. And then my mom said, you know, when you when you're when you're uh, being nice, and and if you promise to be nice, then you might start the violin and I was like okay so let's be nice and then I started with the age of five um and then I always kind of did it just to have a nice uh, hobby kind of I don't know how to say this in like pastime sure, um, yes. and I learned a lot of other things I mean just trying to to how I divide my day how I am productive learn discipline and all of that and then Later, when I was, I think, 13, 14, I had a little crisis and I wanted to stop, actually. And uh, I wanted to become an actress during that time. And then later, my mom said, look, there's a chamber music project coming up. You should really just go and see. And if you still don't like it, OK, then then you can stop. But I want you to go through there just to, to play with people. That was the last and then full really changed, push yeah. to getting Roberta exactly. into the world of music. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and and that was a moment that changed everything. I remember it was um, organized by a youth orchestra in Germany, uh, the Bayerische Landesjugend Orchestra, and it was coached back then by members from the Bayerische Rundfunk Symphony Orchestra. And to be able to work with those people and even play with them in the ensemble, it was just mind blowing, and it changed my attitude towards music so much. And since then, it's like my yeah, my dream. <laughs> To, to be a professional. I feel though, and maybe you can speak about this 13 year old, 14 year old you and the crisis moment where you weren't really sure what you wanted to do. I feel like a lot of musicians have that moment where like, yeah. oh, is this is this cut out for me? And I, yeah. I definitely had that moment. And I'm sure that a lot of professional musicians who are listening to the violin podcast and or someone who is listening right now who is probably going through that moment right now what can you say to the person who is going through this musical crisis that they have uh to yeah. continue pushing forward you know because obviously you know you survived it but what what has worked for you in the past that that can help someone who's listening maybe i have to say because i uh, in my position that i came from a musician family music was like always around and it was yeah it was just you just play music it was in the family you know and I felt at that moment that I didn't have a choice really and I wanted to be a little bit rebellious at that age especially you know when you're a teenager uh, and um, yeah I was also just interested in so many other things so I thought I'm missing something if I don't if I you know don't see friends because obviously practicing the violin takes so much time and you also shouldn't do that when you're young so you always have to find balance. Um, but I think what made me not stop, at least, it, I'm not speaking of, I didn't have fun playing during that time, but I didn't stop at least. And I think it was just the fact that I was different in a way from other people, especially in school. Um, of course, no one understood why I was wasting so much time on my instrument, they said, but... Um, I was just feeling good about making something artsy or being creative. And then also, even if I didn't like it all, most of the time, there were moments where I felt like music is the only way I can describe how I feel. Um, so that kept me going. And then later on, I discovered this. There's exactly that what kept me going. And more of that, that makes music just one of the yeah nicest things to do. Since so, you do come from a... a family of professional musicians although i have to say i'm i'm actually pretty surprised that you know your parents are percussionists and they give you a string instrument i find that to be very yeah. interesting normally that would be like maybe uh because a percussionist usually i don't know for me at least based on my experience they like to hang out with the with the french horns and the trombones yeah <laughs> so maybe you would have you would have been a, a, a brass player but uh very interesting that you that they chose violin i also want to 
ask you, was there, did you feel like there was a level of pressure going into music because your parents were musicians and it's kind of like a, almost this um, unspoken thing that's like, ex it's, a, it's expected of you? Yeah, in some way? of course. Of course, I felt the pressure. And especially at that age when also my teacher started saying, yeah, you should do competitions. And I hate, I absolutely hate competitions until this day. And I don't want to do them. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, okay, if you, if you have auditions coming up, but that's a different thing. Um, of course, pressure. And also about the string instrument, I think my mom back then, she made the decision that she wanted us to be either a pianist or string instrument player at least in the beginning to try see um, because it's supposed and known to be hard she just wanted to check if, if that's something for us and and also like my grandparents that her mother was a string player and the family from my mother's side is mostly string players so oh, so even that's your, what um oh so even your grandparents were string players yeah yeah Wow, so you really do have that lineage of mu of music in your family. Um, my I do. My um, my father's brother, my uncle. You know, he's a he's a musician, bassist, organist, and then my aunt is a violin teacher, actually, who I studied with for ten years before I entered conservatory. So there's that yeah. side of the family where that was music, but uh, but my mother introduced violin to me at a very early age. I mean, she was going into you know college for music education and she's like okay well you know you here's a violin you're gonna start playing it suzuki method right away <laughs> so you know, as, yeah. a, said, as you know you know typical eastern european parent would right you know my, my yeah. parents are from poland so it's like it um he's like you're you're gonna play violin and we're gonna practice and uh yeah i think for me personally i think i started a little too young three and a half is a little young now that i'm well. a pedagogue and teacher but um yeah, how how early did you start? Uh, or you you said you were five, right? When when you yeah, got yeah, I was actually from almost six. Yeah, almost like six that, years. Old. I feel like so that's a I feel like that's a healthy age actually. Five to six years old because the student yeah. like has like established is establishing somewhat of an identity, <laughs> and I feel yeah. like it's I feel like it's so fun, you know, because I have a a few students who are five or six years old. They're like talking back at me a little bit i'm like you're are you trying to outsmart me right now like i feel like i'm in a position like i'm in the position of like teaching you and you're trying to teach me but actually i believe it or not i actually learn a lot from my students because it helps me become a better teacher and that's definitely one of my goals right. this year is just like be more concise with how i explain things to the youngsters and and to my intermediate students who are in their teenage years i do want to speak about the instrument that you play on yeah. currently. And if yeah. you could speak about that, I would really appreciate it. Well, it's uh, Antonio Stradivari from the year 1703, built in Cremona. And it's been loaned to me by a foundation called uh, the Deutsche Stiftung Musiklehre uh, in Hamburg. And uh, I got the instrument when I was, I think, 18. And this whole thing is, is mainly, a, it's a competition, but you have to play a concert. And then there's a jury sitting there and they decide for you which instrument you get. And I was really lucky that this instrument just came back from uh, a fantastic violinist called Tobias Feldman. I don't know if you heard of him, but uh, yeah, he just gave it back the year before or some months before. And then the jury decided to give it to me. And I was just, it was amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy with this instrument. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. Um, have you also played on violins by Guarneri or Amati, or is this like the one uh, instrument? Well, it's actually, I had my own own old violin before that and then the Strad. But of course I tried uh, here and there, uh, Del Gisu or um, Amati, I think once. And also luckily I had the chance to, met, uh, to meet, uh, what's his name again? Joshua Bell, yeah. And we tried his his strat and mine in comparison. And also Augustin Hadelich, we met and did the same and just talked. It was amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you could speak about the the qualities of the instrument, because I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, every instrument has a different personality, even if it's from the same maker. So I was wondering if you could speak about that a little bit to me by um, just by listening to your audition tape and just like listening to your videos on Instagram. It has a very brilliant sound. And I was wondering if you could speak about that a little bit. Yeah, um, brilliant. Yeah, it's very nice that you say that. For me, it always reminds me to 
a mixture of honey and gold, if I may say so. It's not the loudest instrument. And it's not the, how to say it, it has not the biggest bass, um, but it has a very warm and smooth kind of sound. Um, and especially on the E string, I love the high registers because it's really like very brilliant. And yeah, I just love the sound. But of course, I mean, when I got the instrument back then, I remember it was so closed down. It sounded like there was a sordine on it, but it didn't uh, have it was just not played for a while and of course these instruments need to be played otherwise they they don't sound and um, yeah meanwhile the past four years i made some changes in the sound just like to to find the edge of how far can i go because i, I wished a little bit more to have this fuller bigger darker sound and uh, more power of course uh, also now especially in orchestra to get through this whole bunch of a lot of people playing and then you have to play a solo and it has to be strong enough but um yeah it requires certain technique as well i had to change everything i remember when i got it it's just turned turned down my whole technique so yeah so i was wondering if you could speak about that a bit what were some of the things that you had to change because i as a matter of fact um i just Oh, actually, hold on. I'll, I'll bring them over here. For those of you who are watching on the YouTube channel, I'm showing Roberta the tricolor strings, which are the same strings that Joshua Heifetz used to play on. And oh, wow. yeah, and um, not literally the same. He like Joshua Heifetz didn't play on the strings that I tried on, but <laughs> but these are the um, <laughs> there's there's a there's a person in Minnesota who um, bought a machine that created the strings that uh, Heifetz used to play on. And okay. as I was doing the as I was doing the review of these strings, they're primarily gut strings, and they okay. were uh, so difficult to play on, in my opinion. You know, because the D and A were gut and they were varnished, and the G was like a silver wound. Um, okay. And uh, for for anyone who's interested, I'll also leave a link in the show notes for that for that video review. But uh, yeah, they're very interesting. I remember I had to change my playing a like like complete one one hundred eighty degrees on changing my playing yeah. is crazy but uh anyways yeah. yeah what what were some of the things that that you had to change specifically um i think especially my right hand um because i used to have a it was not a bad instrument but uh it uh, yeah it required a lot of like more power i would say and i had to really go until the edge of the bridge to to produce some sound and with this instrument of course i have to do it too but i have to use actually more bow and faster bow to have more of the overtones ringing and um yeah like the clearness maybe from the left hand like to to really be clear with not just pressing or putting down the fingers but also lifting them up um i think that's the main things and of course then when you have such an instrument of that quality you can really go into the tiniest detail of of colors like how to produce colors I, I learned that by by the instrument like it's insane um, and then I once I remember I had to bring this my strat to the to the lute here and I had to play on another instrument and it took out well, took out my old violin and it was it, even though I had the technique for like how to produce a certain color it just didn't work it's I think it has to do something with the instrument of course um, yeah, but a lot of, I think, more right hand than left hand I have to adjust. Yeah, I find that with most strats that I've heard in person, it has exactly yeah. what you describe the qualities as honey and gold. And it's not yeah. so much an in-your-face kind of sound, but uh, no. we had we had Gura Schmidt on the Violin Podcast a few episodes ago. We, we talked about the I-95 sound. You know, I-95 is a hot, is a is a is a highway you know it's a huge road okay. that goes down from washington dc all the way to you know boston through new york and everything like in you know like an autobahn like on the east coast yeah and uh you know with that sound it's really big it's in your face just loud loud sound and it's yeah. um i find that that's a common a struggle amongst American violinists that it's very difficult to produce different types of colors, but that could also be relating to the instrument, could be relating to the technique. Um, 
what are some violent practice tips that you can give to our audience today to help create different colors, different sounds on an instrument that may be somewhat limiting to them at the moment? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think, well, in my case, maybe I'm not the best example for it. And I, I, I know that the Americans have an amazing technique, especially the right hand, uh, because they have a very nice uh, bow stroke, I would say. Like, they use a lot of hair. I don't. <laughs> I, I use uh, maybe a little too little hair because I tend to, to how to say, um, bend my wrist. So, um, but I think... Uh, a mixture of the the speed of the bow, especially, and at what part of like closer to the bridge or closer to the fingerboard. Um, me personally, I love a lot uh, the fingerboard colors, um, but also like, yeah, I don't know how to explain. It's really weird. I never explain it to anyone. Um, yeah, try to to find out where is the, the most pianissimo part you can play or the loudest way you can play without making it an ugly sound. Um, yeah. Without any effort. And also, try, try to make yeah, it sound without any effort. Exactly. It should never be, I think generally, playing the violin should never be uh, filled with effort. It should be as relaxed as possible. Well, you certainly make it look incredibly easy. <laughs> and I think that's, I think that's, I think that is, um, I think that's just so great because that, obviously that is, that is a standard, right? That students seem like, oh my gosh, I want to play like that. But the amount of hours that you practice to be able to make things so easy, I find that I always explain to my young students, like, you got to practice with your metronome because I'm speaking to this person who's a Copenhagen Phil concert master and she probably practices with a metronome like almost always or, or a lot of the time just to get to this position so I, I, I find that so funny but uh, I, I do want to kind of take a, a, another turn because uh, what was really interesting when looking through your Instagram is the, the amount of artwork that you have that you, that you do on your own so I want I, because you mentioned earlier in, in the episode that you know music and violin was a way for you to express yourself and I, I was hoping that you can speak a bit about your visual artwork and your painting yeah well <laughs> thank you for for saying that because to me of course art or painting or drawing has always been just pastime next to violin i never took it really serious and then i think two years three years ago i started painting on canvas because my mom actually she just wanted to cover some some I don't know space on the on the wall and she asked me to to paint something because she knew that I draw um, and then I found out that actually this is also something I could express myself quite well and there's always a message behind the paintings but very very hidden um, personally I love to of course um, to draw human bodies but to Many people I know, it's maybe a little bit too, how do you say? It's not nice to look at people say, that's that's too much. Um, but yeah, drawing, it's been it's been one of my, my favorite things to do next to music. Um, I also sing a little bit and, and I used to dance uh, a lot of ballet when I was younger, but I think art and music is that what, what stayed until today. So um, to me, I feel like yeah. you are the complete artist. You have music, you have <laughs> ballet, dance. You know, you have, uh, you have visual art. You get, you have everything. And um, my, you know, ballet is kind of in, there's an involvement of ballet in my life because you know my wife is a ballet, um, ballet piano collaborator. So she's a yeah. pianist. Yes. So she does, you know, work in in our area. You know, from working with teachers from. The, from the ballet and working with little kids, you know, <laughs> to to adult students, and I find it I find it so fascinating. Yeah. I give so much, so many people, so much respect for trying ballet, um, and uh, it's it's quite difficult, you know, trying to it you is. know trying again just like just like violin playing to jump up in the air and to look completely seamless and flawless. I think that's exactly. I find that to be <laughs> just a gift that I simply do not have. <laughs> Me neither. That's why I gave it up when I was yeah. like, when I decided to be a violinist. I, I just stopped dancing because it requires the same amount of time, at least, maybe more. 
I don't know. Yeah, you know, I I feel like the performing arts in general, you know, you are an athlete. You are simply an athlete. You know, you have to take care of your body, not just phys- you know, your physical body, but you know, your your you know, your mental state as well. And yeah. you, you kind of have to be focused, especially if you're sitting in a concert master position when you are responsible for everyone. And uh yeah, it's just just a fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time, honestly. And I wish <laughs> that I can I can meet you in person and speak to you in person. My goal is once this whole pandemic is kind of done, that I can you know fly to places around the world and actually speak to you know people around the world in person. That that's definitely one of my goals. You know, hopefully, in the next you know Please year do. and a half or two. Yeah. Is is there um is there like a like a like a great because I also see your Instagram and I see like all the amazing food and I'm just like, I'm so jealous that I'm not in Copenhagen right now. Do you recommend any great places? Like, are, are there any like places that you're like, oh my gosh, this is like one of the best meals in Copenhagen and I have to go. Like, I just love this. There is definitely. And I think Copenhagen is known for having very good restaurants. I've never been myself uh, because it's known to be also very expensive. But uh, one day for sure, we'll go and book a table. Uh, one is Noma. Uh, I think they just got a Michelin star in Paris, uh, being rated one of the best restaurants in the world. And also The Alchemist, which is a very interesting concept behind because they combine food uh, and the visual uh, aspects of food. Uh, it's a bit crazy. I That's think fantastic. they have a website where you can check it, but it's it's amazing. And I know that there's a lot of celebrities and famous people, rich people going there and having <laughs> nice meals. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I hope I hope to visit Copenhagen or in Germany or wherever you are in uh, Eastern yeah. Europe to 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 just have another conversation because I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I asked this question towards the end of my interviews for every violinist who is listening. And what what can you do to, to what can you say to the people who are listening, who are having doubts about their music career this is more so for, more so a conversation for the professional musician or the person who is contemplating their their music career based on the events of the world that are happening right now you know it's a lot of soloists are canceling concerts and you know because of local regulations and i don't want to you know get into politics or whatever that's not that's not what this podcast podcast is for but i was hoping if you can speak to the person who's listening what what steps they can take to ensure that if they do want to have a career in music, it is feasible for them and what has worked for you well, that may work for someone else. Yeah. I have to say it's a, it's a very, very good question because it really occupies also my mind. And it did, I think last year, especially we had a second lockdown coming and I was really devastated that I thought I, I can't do this job anymore because everything seems to stand in my way. But then I thought, Okay, if I think, could I imagine a life without violin or without music? No. And why is that? Because there's so much I still need to do and so much I still want to do and experience and just share, share my, myself. And, and, you know, when you play music, you kind of have, have to, to, to get naked in front of everyone and just show the in, inside of your heart and just try to make, yeah, to share who you are. And I think if that's, in yourself if, if you really have this message that you want to give then you should never of course never stop and and just of course i mean we don't know how these times develop and and um how things turn out and if, if classical music world will still exist in some years i have no idea but i think i can do my part and just at least make it until then part of my life and like have a message that i want to share yeah. I think it's very well said. Thank you so much, Roberta, for you know, <laughs> taking the time to speak with me today. And uh, you know, I know I know you're busy with you know with your rehearsal schedule and your performance schedule. So I really, really appreciate your time. And for those of you who are listening, if you made it all the way to the end <laughs> of this podcast <laughs> episode, then I really appreciate if you you know rate the podcast if you can. Also, be sure to subscribe if you're not a subscriber already. It helps us out to provide more great interviews like we had with Roberta for you. And uh, yeah, leave a comment, visit us on violentpodcast.com and also, you know, share some of your favorite moments on 
social media. Thanks so much. And Roberta, I hope to see you in person. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank yeah. you as well. Thank you. <laughs>